our second interview, we have a lovely guest named Leslie Todd, who's also my lovely sister. Um, and I have the pleasure of talking to her about her mental health today. And so just before we start diving into kind of your mental health journey and what your, your views on the stigma surrounding mental health, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so my mental health um, journey started from childhood. Um, my parents uh, described me as a baby, almost colicky, but I would scream and I would scream and um, uh, they would just have to put me in my crib to uh, keep me safe. Um, I think there is frustration from my parents, um, just not knowing what to do. And then as I got older, um, anxiety, um, I remember moving schools and like literally grabbing the banister um, and having a wonderful teacher that really worked um, with with me and my parents to sort of start the journey of overcoming some of that. Um, and then I, I also had panic attacks. Um, luckily, most of them happened at night. Um, I would pace back and forth and kind of wish someone would be there, and, but then didn't want them to be there. Um, and then, you know, as you learn the tools and kind of grow and mature a little bit, um, fortunately, um, they stopped. Um, and then, um, yeah, even up until today, um, just after my mom passed away, I um, started um, more of a medical approach to treating the anxieties, meaning um, medication. Um, and it was very much of like, I was doing the counseling, you know, I was, you know, exercise is not a real an issue for me. Um, and I, I remember saying to my doctor, I'm like, I have talked and I feel like there's nothing to talk about or nothing left to talk about. And yet I still feel like crap. Um, and that's when we kind of um, started uh, the um, more medical approach to um, um, treatment, I guess. Um, um, and then in terms of stigmas, I, I think, especially in children, right, one of the things I kind of, not in a bad way, but wonder what, what might have been different um, had treatment or in, more of a structured intervention um, been in place at a younger, at a younger age. Um, my mom had her own mental health um, journey, and it's just recently um, that I found out that she was suicidal um, at times. And so, um, you, you know, what are the genetic predispositions, right? Um, and... Uh, and so, uh, yeah, it was, I, I think too, like from my childhood is, you know, you have a parent with mental health challenges. Um, how does that not affect? Um, and unfortunately my mom was very um, not open to having conversations around her own mental health, which as I got older made it very much more difficult um, to, to um, go through my own <laughs> mental health journey because uh, 
I often felt misunderstood. Um, so for example, um, I had done some reading and I kind of had this aha moment of, ah, this is biological. Like this is biology. This isn't necessarily in my head, um, which I think counseling is great and it needs to be a part of the treatment, but it can't be necessarily for a lot of people, the only treatment. Um, and when I shared this with mom, um, it was very dismissed. And so I think bridging that gap that, um, that there is psychological, it can, and sometimes it is in your head, so to speak, but there's often also other underlying factors. I think we've come a, a, somewhat of, in a way of um, understanding that it's there and now it's kind of, what are the causes, why, um, et cetera. Mm -hmm. No, thank you for sharing all that. And I think you bring up a really good point in that the approaches to mental health is very individual and unique to each individual and the ways it manifests and the ways you treat is going to be different for everyone. And so thank you for bringing a unique voice to that. Um, and you kind of mentioned how you think that early childhood intervention would have been maybe the most effective um, way of altering your mental health journey. Um, but with the resources you did have, what have you found the most helpful in guiding or um, approaching in your mental wellness journey? Um, so I, I think, so a lot of that didn't come until later. I mean, again, counseling is a big foundational piece don't get me wrong it is um definitely a foundational piece um part of the problem is is cost right mm -hmm. to in alberta i know madison you, you you're kind of doing know a lot about bc funding model but counseling is uh a 200 dollars a session, it's, mm -hmm. it can be a financial burden. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm lucky in the sense that I have the means to do that. Um, and so, yeah, counseling is definitely a foundational piece. And the reason is, is it does get um, provide um, insight into thought patterns, repetitive, sort of habitual thought patterns, um, uh, meditation. And so sort of my definition of meditation isn't um, about necessarily quieting your mind. It's more about quieting it so that you can hear the thoughts. And then I kind of have a systematic journaling approach where I um, kind of first um, just sort of free write whatever comes to my head, it kind of goes um, on paper. Um, and then you kind I kind of look at it and it's like, hmm, what, what is not sitting right? What is not quote unquote functional for me what is what are some of my barriers and then I um and and they usually are in forms of thoughts so then I take those and then I build sort of mantras around around that and I'm just gonna actually grab my journal so and and I've gotten good at it that I don't even really need to write I can just think the thought, change the thought, and 
and move move on. Um, I'll try to find an example is sort of like I can trust my gut instincts, right? Like, and that becomes a mantra. Um, through counseling, we look at sort of um, traumas or key um, moments and then um, kind of come up. Um, and so it's make it more all encompassing. So a statement like, all the ways and times I was not allowed to live my own dreams. And then in counseling, there's a whole um, modality that she uses um, to help uh, clear, clear those traumas or um, key um, life events that may have contributed to the patterned thought thought process so mm -hmm. um and then yeah more recently in the last sort of five years is medication and for me it hasn't made it completely better but it's helped take the edge off a little bit so I still feel anxious, but it's not paralyzing. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, thanks for sharing that. And I'm sure hopefully like other people um, take your suggestions away in terms of journaling and kind of writing mantras, because I think that is so important in getting your thoughts down and um, kind of changing those thought patterns. And it sounds like you've put a lot of work into that. Um, so I know you mentioned that you felt stigmatized by your mom and I should clarify by when I say sisters we're half sisters so we share a dad and have different moms um, and um, so can if you feel comfortable can you share other times you've maybe felt stigmatized for your mental health and maybe how you overcame that or how you're overcoming that so one of the sort of real um, kind of illustrations was actually at mom's, my mom's funeral or service. Um, my brothers had talked about how mom was telling them to lead their authentic selves. And um, I was kind of sitting there like, that's a message I never heard from, from my mom. Right, I, I'm an empath, so I work with special needs children. Whereas my mom was very driven, corporate Calgary, you, you know, money, um, and so the fact that my brothers heard "live your authentic self," and then that's a message that I never heard um and i think a large part that has to do because my brain is obviously very different than my brothers um but my brothers fell more in line with that trajectory mm -hmm. of what my mom kind of um was um and I think a large part of that had to do with feeling like mom was trying to fix me and put me in a path mm -hmm. to a certain, rather than letting it be an organic, organic um, process. Sorry, there's... Mm -hmm garbage truck right outside my window um so um it yeah it often felt like there was a a pushing like you have to be this way when my brain didn't fit that um like I just would not do well in corporate mm -hmm. in a corporate setting like that's that's just not Mm -hmm. me um and I mean that's that that's a tough question because 
you know, to, to differentiate that question from love, right? Like, you know that she's doing the best with, that she can in, in the context of family and, and that dynamic. So it's, it's a little more of a, a tough question. Um, and especially understanding in hindsight, mom's own mental health. So I, uh, I, I have come to the realization that a lot of our struggle was because she struggled with dealing with her own mental health. And so it kind of had a, uh, a trickle down, right? I think she recognized that I had mental health challenges, but because she didn't have a good grasp on her own, mm -hmm. how, how, mm -hmm. how do you help someone when you don't have the grasp of it? Um, so yeah, whether that's stigma or mom feeling her own stigma within corporate Calgary and then trying to essentially pr protect um who knows right um so yeah that's that that's a little bit of a tougher, <laughs> tougher no, definitely. no absolutely and I think that's an important distinction and that we like there's there's an internal stigma that can impact how you impact how you influence others and how you act towards others and comfort others or whether that's a maternal relationship or familial or friend um, speaking to the community that surrounds you and the society we live in have you felt stigmatized in terms of your mental health mm, you know recently I've felt a lot more free um and, and, and I think that just comes to where I am at my own journey. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, you know, when um, our, our aunt died, I mean, there, there was very little compassion for, for that at work. Um, you, you know, they're like, well, you're negative. Like, well... If you actually look at what happened, right? Um, to give you a little bit of background, our aunt uh, died in a scuba diving accident and it was very sudden. Um, and she's on vacation and then one, the next day she's not coming home. Um, so it, it, it was very sudden. It was very... Um, and it was really our, our, as a family, our first experience, like it, at least in our generation of the family experience with um, mortality and death. And so, um, yeah, it, it all, um, but yeah, their whole as well, you're being negative, like, well, no, I'm not sure how to deal with all of these emotions. And yeah, it might be coming out as negative, but there was no, it's like, you have to change this. You have to, and there, yeah, there was no um, empathy to, towards it. Mm -hmm. um, and it was not sitting, it wasn't like, hey, what's going on? What's right? Um, yeah. Just have those simple questions rather than an outside labeling it. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, you know, I think, I think that is, is slowly changing and, and I think it depends on each company and, what they do and you know bereavement and all of that um you know another example was I had a little kiddo stop breathing on me and so again I work with special needs kids he was a high risk kid 
And um, unfortunately, the company that I worked for did not know how to handle it. Um, so I had told them that I just need a couple days before we kind of um, do a, a, a debrief. Like I, I just, I, I couldn't even. And then when I reached out, they kind of cut me off. They literally said, um, uh, you're being a bully right? Because I, I began to become quite emphatic of we need to talk about this, not just from my perspective, but this can't happen again. There were some key things that needed to change. And yeah, they um, yeah just turned around and said, you're being a bully. You are not to call us and you're not to talk to anyone so they essentially isolated me from uh, a traumatic experience um and even dealing with first aids right like even i remember um doing a first aid scenario or not scenario um first aid treatment at a warehouse and it it, it was nothing serious it wasn't um but it was so hard to to get back and, and focused and so um yeah um I mean those are corporate but with even in our own family I know my dad's journey along with me um you know he's he's Bless him has evolved with me. And, um, but as a kid, right, he would get so frustrated, right? And, and now we, we both kind of recognize the reason I would walk away is not because I was being defiant, that was anxiety, mm -hmm. um, right? Like there's, um, right? Um, but again, bless my dad he's 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 evolved and you know we have our own cues right you know one of my favorite sayings is dad if it was that easy it wouldn't be a problem mm -hmm. right yeah. or you know I again this is progression from um and it's a higher uh, ability to deal with anxiety but the rec recognition that anxiety isn't always rational um but I will often say to my dad like I need a check is is this my rational brain or is it my irrational brain and and having that um person to or say I just need, I know I'm in irrational. I just need to, I call um, verbal diarrhea it out to, to make sense of it. Um, and so, you know, finding those ways to, to do that. Um, and again, my dad, bless his soul, has been that, that, that person. Mm -hmm. um, for me so yeah no thank you for sharing all the workplace scenarios as well as the other personal ones and it sounds like there is a lot of room to grow in the corporate world in terms of being there's room for growing compassion and empathy and um it seems to be a lack of understanding that everyone has their own journey behind them and their own things going on in life that isn't quite recognized all the time and well, and it's 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 also like workplace accidents or like when you have a critical incidence the, they're you know those are easy things to have policies and procedures mm -hmm. in place mm -hmm. right um even first aid right like even just recently we had a little kiddo fall hurt his elbow it, it was a 
nothing happened, but I, I recognized right away um, that uh, my coworker was not handling it well. Um, the other thing I should point out too is, and I, I need, is um, uh, the Red Cross and St. John's Ambulance has now put together a psychological first aid. And so we need more and more people to access that. So when the critical incident happens, that it, it, it becomes automatic as if first aid. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is a recognition to, to that. Um, and so, yeah, um, both believe both the Red Cross, I know St. John's for sure has um, the psychological um, first aid um, and, 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 and making that more of an awareness, making just like first aid, having more, a certain percentage of your employees having that training. So it could be um, that, that go-to person. Now, they're not counselors, but they can, can, yeah. be that bridge step in the right direction for sure and and I think you bring up a good point that this is a systemic um change it's not just a personal change on personal level levels although we can all do our part uh, but it is really policies and the way workplaces are approached and um things such as the physical uh aid things that you're talking about um and psychological kind of first aid well, when you, I'm sorry, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that it's so important to, to heal that physical side, but also realize that there's that mental and psychological aspect that's affected as well for not only the person involved in an accident, but also those who are caretaking that accident. And, so it's, and, and that goes to, and, and it's not just work like accidents, like caregivers, uh, when so my mom died of cancer and there was, I read somewhere that I can't remember, but a certain percent of, and it was a vast big number of caregivers or cancer specifically. And I'm sure I would hypothesize that it would go across all um, sort of critical illness. Um, developed uh, some form of post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, we can take it from a an acute trauma situation all the way up to caretakers of chronic conditions. It's it's not it's not uniform. And I think the t thing is, and you alluded to it is. It, and this is something that makes me curious now is two people can see the same incidents. One may come away with post-traumatic stress and the other might not. Mm -hmm. Like the big question to me is what's the difference? Yeah. Because they're both at play on the biological systems it's not just a head thing it it's a play one triggered a biological response and the other did not mm -hmm. why why is that you know soldiers you know you can be in the same war be on the same convoy and why is it that some soldiers come back Mm -hmm. with post-traumatic stress and others don't like that's that's a a fascinating question and a fascinating thing that we need to remember that just because you see the same event doesn't mean we're going to process it mm -hmm. the same and I think also going through my own journey that is a, an important perspective to say that it's not just me right mm -hmm. like it's not it's because I see something differently it kind of there's makes it have a little bit of that acceptance piece of absolutely of, 
of it. So, I mean, no, it's, absolutely. I find that question that is fascinating. Really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. It is really fascinating. And I think there's research going into that now. So I don't know if there is a defined answer, but maybe parts of it will be answered. Um, and so I'm just going to tie it back around to stigma and um, kind of our goal in creating a space where open dialogue is the new normal in terms of talking about mental health and wellness. And so what do you think we can all do on an individual level day to day in order for this destigmatization and fostering of an open dialogue to take place? Well, I, I think it's, it's um, recognizing that we all have our own lenses in which we see things. Again, it kind of is the same with um, the two, see the same two events, right? But those two people have different colored lenses in which they see. And it's taking those lenses off to try to empathize or try to, to process. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, media does not help us in that in that um, regard, whether it's politics or means social media, or um, we really have to stop and question, okay, wh what are the motives? Why? Why? Um, in my line of work, um, again, working with special needs, um, understanding all behaviors have a function. So for example, little kid having a ten temper tantrum, right? Is it because they are hungry or tired or, right? But all behavior has a function. Mm -hmm. And if we look at each other's, okay, they are doing this for a reason mm -hmm. and asking the question, why? Mm -hmm. So if we have a fundamental understanding of why, mm -hmm. then, or even just the ability to ask the question, right? Like coming up to someone's like, I noticed you do this. Why? Or what's going on? Right. Um, then it kind of, helps to take out some of that uh cloudiness over the lenses um mm -hmm. but yeah that's sort of instrumental in what i do with three four five year five-year-olds is in behavior modification is trying to figure out what is the function right and then we can kind of you know have you know, age appropriate conversations with, with, with the kiddos or, you know, play games to teach them certain skills to have mm -hmm. a, of a more um, re, uh, regulated um, behavior. Yeah. Um, but that goes for adults too, right? Why, what, what is the function of addictions? Mm -hmm. Right. Again, you can use the same qu question for addictions. What function is that addiction serving? Mm -hmm. Right. And then again, it creates a, a framework of conversation. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's so important. And it kind of ties that message back to what we were speaking about earlier and that everyone has their own journey and everyone has their own story and what they're going through. And it's so important to be compassionate and empathetic towards that and not make snap judgments about someone because you never know what someone's going through. Um, exactly. and, and that definitely is, there's room to grow with that in our society. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think fundamentally, and I have no idea how you do this, but our, our media mm -hmm. needs to be a part of that, that equation, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, right? Yeah. We have a big push on, you know, inclusion 
in diversity in um, in the visible um, diversity, mm -hmm. um, but you know our news tends to be such ingrained in fear and and in violence quite frankly when we look at news cycles what are they focusing on right and and i'm not saying that they shouldn't some of these issues shouldn't be focused on but it's just a bombardment of this this and same with our um tv and and um right body images and and again it, it's slowly changing um but that's a big thing that i think even we need to recognize within our own selves that this is not real and it's hard especially with anxiety when you're you're grasping at straws of like just what is rational what is irrational <laughs> right like and and so like i i just had to stop watching the news as much as i want to be informed on world um issues i literally it mm -hmm. is too anxiety provoking and is there a way we can report news that isn't such a assault to the nervous system yeah absolutely and it's hard when the world is full of tough things going on right now as well and there are those polarizing effects and moving to a world of more inclusion is so important um so hopefully we do things like that such as on this interview and posting and letting voices like yours be heard to foster that environment of inclusion um, and kind of make it known that having this open dialogue is important and is wanted um, to, to kind of make that compassionate world. Um, and so I think we've run out of time now, but is there anything else you'd like to add before we end this? No, and I, I, th I think, especially with anxiety, the thing is, is everyone has anxiety right? It's what pushes you to action, right? Some just have it. And so it, it's when I, I actually gave a presentation on anxiety and performance um, and uh, with my refereeing group and uh, everyone kind of stopped. And, and the analogy that I used is a lot of singers will say, every time I go on stage, I have butterflies. Mm -hmm. that's anxiety mm -hmm. right and so it's kind of like we all have these fundamental physiological re reactions and so that it kind of that is the norm right it, it pushes you to stay safe but it also pushes you to work on a paper or go to work or whatever so everyone has those fundamental um and so it's we're actually not all that that different no and that's important to recognize as well and we just all have our own relationship with that and you know anxiety exactly. excitement is like the one in the same but the perspective is different um based on what your mindset is and our relationship with that yeah is unique um, mm -hmm. But again, thank you, thank you for sharing your own unique experience with that. And um, with that, I'll end the interview. I'll just stop the recording. <laughs>